so excited about this healthcare panel. Um, we have some really great experiences here. Um, and I, I don't know what they're going to say to my question. So I'm really excited about it. Um, and hopefully Jenna or Terry is going to pin the right people when I say their names so we can have like a Brady Bunch style layout. Um, okay, so welcome to our healthcare panel discussion uh, with Lucy Diaz, Heather McCain, Heather Lamb, Barry Arana, and Roger Jones. Um, thank you to our panel sponsor, Chair Stuff. If you don't know who they are, who are you even? Um, if you're looking for excellent service with a personal touch, Chair Stuff carries a wide range of bowel and bladder products, the right, right price and best of all delivered to your door. Um, and now on to our panelists. Uh, Lucy Diaz is a grade 10, 11 student who has many hobbies. She started advocating for accessibility in 2018 with her mom. And in the beginning, she tried to use any conversation to create awareness. Uh, that is why she reached out to politicians, from mayors to MLAs to MPs. She's currently contacting hospitals and other places to get real accessible washrooms installed. She says advocating is slow and painful, but worth it. It all starts by doing what's necessary, then do what's possible, and suddenly you are doing the impossible. Heather McCain describes themselves as disabled and neurodivergent. They are the executive director of Creating Accessible Neighborhoods, a nonprofit they founded in 20, 2005. Heather is a well-known and respected advocate, speaker, and educator. Heather is proudest to be known as a crypt doula. This is a disability justice term bestowed by a community for someone who helps disabled people navigate our complex systems, provide resources, find support, and build community. Heather Lamb is Spinal Cord Injury BC's Information Resource Specialist, whose voice you'll hear if you call our info line. Heather is visually impaired and has been advocating on her own behalf for most of her life. She also participates in many group advocacy efforts on disability issues and fields many calls about advocacy issues on our info line as well. Barry Arana is now 10 years post-injury. He's a research co coaching coordinator for the University of Toronto and a volunteer for Spinal Cord Injury BC. Since his injury, he had to learn how to advocate for himself for his home support needs, like scheduling his approved daily hours to suit his needs and life and choosing his home support workers. Even traveling, some airlines are not easy to deal with. And Barry says that knowing what your rights are is really important. Roger B. Jones, also known as the Ability Guy, has been doing this for a while. He has been advocating within uh, and for the disability community since he sustained a spinal cord injury in 1985. His efforts have led to requests to consult and speak across North America. Now required, Roger is trying to learn how to stay healthy and enjoy himself. So I get everyone? I think I got everyone. Thumbs up or wave or nod your head if I got everyone. Awesome. Okay, so thank you all. And um, I hope everyone will welcome our um, panelists. You can like wave or thumbs up or use your reactions um, to show your welcome or type in the chat. Um, but what I'm going to do is I have three pre-prepared questions. And we have an hour for this session. So um, while I'm asking those questions, um, we invite uh, people from the audience to put their hand up um, or write their question in the chat and our staff behind the scenes will catch it and we will make sure to ask them for you or we, if you have your hand up, we will uh, call your name and unmute you so you can ask it yourself. Alrighty. Um, so here's our opening uh, question. I'm going to ask. Um, I'm going to ask the first person, and then when you're done answering, you can you can pick the next person to go. Okay. So um, so Lucy, I'm going to ask you first. Can everybody can can you share a story from your experience where you had to advocate for yourself and what you learned from the experience? Yeah, so well, mainly I advocate for my sister because she has cerebral palsy and cannot speak. So I speak for her. And one story, for example, was a community center that was being built in my city. 
and there was going to be a pool and that would have been great we could take amy um to those places but the problem is that the washroom was not accessible for her and there was no way for us to go to enjoy the pool or go to the library for any extended of time period of time with her there so we spent a long time sending emails back and forth sometimes we didn't respond we had to um nag them a lot um but we were able to get a changing table placed and a hoist so that anyone who uses diapers or cannot lift themselves out of their chair without assistance can go and also protect caregivers who have to pull you out of your chair like my mom has already gotten an injury because of so many years of trying to take my sister out of her chair without having a hoist and what I learned from that is be be consistent and don't be afraid to be annoying because a lot of times people will not listen and will maybe forget about you or forget about the issue but if you nag them enough they will pay attention because they just want to get you out of the way good advice do you want to pick the next person oh yeah sorry um barry sounds good hello hello everyone um so a story that i have in mind um Probably once I was discharged from GF and I was, I found a place downtown, BC housing. The difficult part was um, adjusting to the home support from the agency downtown that I was receiving, which was at uh, back then was St. Elizabeth and they were constantly changing my worker. They were constantly changing my time that I was receiving the service. And I thought that was common practice, but I was getting frustrated because as you all know, we like to develop a routine and we build around, you know, getting our morning routine done so we can have the rest of the day to do what we want to do. And so it was really frustrating the fact that they were, you know, willy nilly changing my time, changing the worker. And, you know, it's really difficult getting a new worker in because they don't know how, you know, to take care of you, what your needs are exactly, how to transfer you properly and safety, safely, right? So it was, it was a nightmare. And so, I got fed up and I went to their management and I brought it to my case manager as well. And I found out that um, no, that's shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. The agreed time should be what they should be providing me consistently. Cause you know, we're all about schedules and routine, it helps are, you know, for ways, it's part of my quality of life, you know, getting, having that consistent um, time and the worker that I work well with that I know will, you know, take care of my needs and, and everything else. Um, and I also found out that there are organizations like Patient Quality Care Office that I can reach out to, to, um escalate matters or you know uh, or file an official complaint but um you know once i did that thankfully that scheduler knew better that she couldn't push me around and i knew what my rights are and you know i was i had to learn fast that I, in the beginning i thought that they could you know, they were dictating what was going to happen to me, but actually, no, we have a say in, in things. So that was a, a really important lesson for, for me. Anyways. Thanks, Barry. Who, who should go next? Uh, is Roger one of the one? Of, okay, yep. sounds good. Take it away. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm Roger. And uh, I was hard pressed to pick one particular story, 
Um, but I can recall when I was early on, um, shortly after the onset of my injury, I was living in Nova Scotia and we didn't have a program like the CISO program here, which is an individualized funding type model. And I thought that uh, it would be valuable to have such a thing because they were trying to force me into an institution at the time. And I was 25 years old and I just couldn't see why I had to, you know, be committed to an institution when I was kind of just starting out. And uh, so what I did was I organized the disability community in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and we actually marched to the legislature and got an audience with the premier. And so um, I can't remember how many people there were, maybe a hundred people. We had wheelchairs and people with visual impairments and walkers, and it was, it was pretty amazing. And uh, so we're in the chambers and I really didn't know what we were going to do. I didn't have a lot of experience. Um, I just knew that it was the right thing. And so I just asked the people that were with me to start telling the stories um, about their lives. And so one after another, each person got up and they talked about why it was that they felt that they should get this funding to be able to hire their own um, personal staff. Partway through our presentation, the premier stopped us and just said, I'm convinced we're going to start a pilot program, which they did. So that was the first individualized funding program in Nova Scotia. So what I learned from that was, I think, two things. One is the power of storytelling. I mean, none of us were particularly politically astute at the time. Um, you know, some of the people were educated, some of the people weren't, but just getting there and being honest and telling their stories, we were able to convince the government of the day to do something that no one had successfully been able to do before. Um, and the second part of it for me was working together with other people. I mean, we always think that we have the answers, um, but I've, I've now learned that there's a lot of people out there who um, have a lot better ideas than myself sometimes. And sometimes you have to take a step back and listen to others and work with them. And uh, so, yeah, I think that was experience for me. Uh, Heather McCain, I guess, is part of the panel. Thanks, Roger. Um, yeah, uh, like Roger said, there's a lot that uh, I could choose from. So I'll go to the uh, to why I started my nonprofit, which is I was living out in Maple Ridge at a time and it had taken me six years to get a diagnosis. And I had essentially not left my house unless for medical appointments during those those six years. And I finally got a power wheelchair and was like, all right, I get to kind of restart my life and, uh, and get out into the community. Was super excited. And 50% of the time, the bus drivers would lie and say that the ramps weren't operating because they didn't want to take the time to put it down for me. And this was in the day of the three steps um, ramps, which had to come out and then go down all the way. And uh, where I lived, the bus came once an hour. So essentially, if one driver said no, then the whole day was shot. And um, I wrote letter after letter to TransLink and, and got no response. And somebody in my chronic pain group suggested that I needed to find an organization to support me. And I couldn't find any that were willing to take the, uh, the issue on. And somebody jokingly said, well, you should start your own organization. Um, and I thought that was funny. And then it kept kind of circling in my head. And I thought, you know, I'm running a chronic pain support group at the time in Maple Ridge. And so I appointed some of our members as the first board started creating accessible neighborhoods. We were citizens for accessible neighborhoods uh, then um, and uh, wrote the same letter to TransLink, but this time with executive director of and got a response a week later from TransLink found out that they actually had a policy about this, which was that um, the bus drivers were to call for a taxi and the taxi was actually to take you to your final destination, not actually where the 
uh, that bus was going. Um, however, most bus drivers would say that they had not heard of it. So um, it wasn't solved yet. And so what I started doing was printing out ver uh, copies of the policy and providing them to people in Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows so that they could have it in their pocket so that the transit driver, if they said they weren't aware of it, then you could pull it out and say, here you go. Also worked with Translink to make sure that it was reposted in the break rooms and uh, the, the driving depots so that it was visible to drivers. Um, and had a lot less people experiencing this. And personally, it was a lot better for me as well. And, um, and so it was just kind of continuing to do that and also kind of showing to TransLink how many people this was affecting as well. Um, because unfortunately, one of the things that people often think about people with disabilities is that we're this small special interest group and not the world's largest minority and the third largest economic power behind the US and China. Um, and so it's, you know, showing that there is might in numbers and that there are a lot of people who have these issues or similar issues. And then essentially what happened with advocating on that one issue was that I became a, a consultant for TransLink and have worked with them for over a decade and also had so many other people come to us because once they heard that we were able to make progress on that one issue, um, you know, they brought all sorts of other accessibility issues to us and we started working with government and companies. Um, but really it was, it came out of self-interest <laughs> and my own need in order to solve this issue and, and stubbornness. And as Lucy said, you know, that persistence of continuing to, to go after it. And even when it's not fun, um, you know, like writing the letter after letter and doing, we, I did some reports for TransLink because I didn't think their reports were uh, capturing how the accessibility was affecting transit users. Um, and so, you know, I also think it's really important to have things in writing. I always made sure that any conversation that I had verbally with someone from TransLink, I would follow up with an email saying, as per our conversation, and then outline what we had talked about so that there was then a dated record of us having a conversation. And that way they could also correct any misconception that I had or you know, understood of what they had said to make sure that we were clear and understanding where each other was. And I found that that was very helpful because all too often uh, people would try to pass uh, the issue on to some other department. And so I would always request, you know, okay, but I need to have an email from you saying that you are passing me on to this person so that I know who's passing me on just in case uh, they need verification. And I suggest people do that with doctors too. Like if a doctor ever says that they're not going to do something for you, have them write it in your chart that they have declined to do a test or declined to do a, a referral um, because it's always good to have that paper trail. So um, that was kind of the beginning of the organization and uh, we've evolved from there. And I will pass it to the other Heather. <laughs> or another Heather, I shouldn't say the other. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Heather. So like Heather, um, my the story I'm gonna tell started off as self-interest, but ended up becoming a bit of a policy change. So about a year ago, I needed a COVID test. And in my community, the COVID testing center is about a 45 minute walk. I don't drive because I'm visually impaired. And the isolation rules at that time said, no taxis, no public transit, no carpooling with anybody outside the household. And I happened to live alone. So I had the, my only option was to walk there because I was feeling perfectly healthy, not a problem, but it made me realize that what if I was actually sick or what if it happens again when the weather's really bad and or the sidewalks are not navigable. So I started following up with various groups within the health community and government to try and find out what the rules actually say for somebody in my situation, nobody would give me an answer about what I should have done in that situation if I hadn't been able to go on my own to the appointment. So I did put in an official complaint with my health authority um, after trying many other options. And the health authority came back, kind of gave a wishy-washy answer and said, I should have just told a taxi driver that I might have COVID and let them deal with it. And I thought, well, no, that's not a really good answer. So I escalated it to the Provincial Review Board through the Patient Quality Care Office. 
and did get a hearing about oh, maybe six months later. And they actually agreed with me and said that my complaint was totally valid, that the health authorities should have options for people who are not able to uh, transport themselves to a COVID testing center. But even better for me, uh, they made the ruling applicable to vaccination clinics as well. So they said there had to be options in every community for people to get mobile vaccinations and or tests as needed. Um, and that those options should be offered when people were making their appointments. I don't know if that actually happened in every community, but I did hear anecdotally that some people were offered a mobile option uh, for their vaccine, which is really good. So it started off as me just being kind of angry at the system and wanting to know what I should do next time. But it ended up being a bit of a policy change. And it's, more importantly, it's now on the record that that uh, review happened. And if something like this comes up again, we can point to that and say, there was a ruling about this. The health authorities should be paying attention um, to anyone who doesn't have transportation to meet their healthcare needs. So that was a long process. It was not a quick fix. It took a lot of writing of letters and a lot of back and forth with a variety of levels of government, and different people. Um, I felt like giving up most of the time, but I'm glad I pursued it because there was a positive result in the end. Awesome. Thank you all for uh, sharing those with me. Um, so I've given a heads up to the audience that if they have a question, they should put their hand up or uh, put their question in the chat because um, coming up soon, I'm going to ask them for that. Um, but I'm just going to uh, go ahead and ask you one more question in the meantime, because I don't think I see any hands yet. So um, one thing we heard from um, our from Tara, our first speaker, as well as it's come up in a few of the conversations we've heard, um, is the issue of how um, stereotypes and judgments about certain symptoms and people uh, affect our healthcare. I'm wondering um, if any of you have any um, input or suggestions for people struggling with that kind of um, sort of brick wall or, or attitudinal barrier with someone in who is their healthcare provider, whether it's a doctor or a clinician. Um, it's something that's come up on the jam boards a little bit. So I'm curious if any of you has a suggestion on how to approach it. I can start. Um, so one of the groups that I run is called Chronically Queer and that's for 2S LGBTQI plus people. Uh, with chronic health conditions and this is a conversation that comes up quite a lot because many of our members myself included have to educate uh, medical professionals about our various identities uh, i'm personally trans non-binary queer asexual and aromantic um, and you know you, you often think that this isn't going to come up in a doctor's appointment about my arthritis is or connective tissue disorder or that kind of thing but just things like um, as someone who's asexual which means I have no sexual attraction to anybody um, I've never had sex and when doctors go through their questions about you know are you sexually active and I say no never have been they think I'm lying and then they then think I'm lying about other things such as do you drink alcohol do you smoke all this kind of stuff um, and so I'm constantly having to educate them about what asexuality is and that there's 1% of the population, uh, the same amount of number that of people who are redheaded are asexual and having to educate uh, just as many in our group chronically queer have to. And one of the things that I suggest, um, which is similar to my previous um, uh, suggestion, oh, thanks for adding that in the comments, uh, Jocelyn. Um, is to have the information already with you um, to provide to them that's on paper and also it helps you be able to advocate for yourself because you already know what you want to say. Often when you're in with a medical professional, there's a huge pressure of time. You have 15 minutes with this person and you already thought that was going to be short just for what you went to talk to them about. So now you have to educate them. Um, and this is particularly frustrating for a lot of trans people who have to educate um, medical professionals and feel that they spend more time educating than they do actually receiving services. Um, and so having something in writing is good because not only can you go off of that, 
which helps to control some of the emotions that you're feeling about this dismissal of who you are as a person uh, and the fact that they aren't educated about the different identities. But you're also better able to encapsulate what you want to say because it's already been prepared either by yourself or that you've gotten off of a, another website. Um, and you're also able to leave them with something. Um, and often it's good to leave them with other resources. Like if you have questions, here are organizations that you can ask. Don't ask your random trans patients because you happen to have them in front of you. Go and ask you know, people who are paid to help you learn. And, um, and so that's really helpful. It's also really good to be able to talk to other people. That's why Chronically Queer and the peer support groups with SCI are really important so that you can talk to other people and understand that this is not a personal thing. It's not about who you are individually. It's about um, the world catching up to learning about these identities and one another helping each other. And that when you help to educate a medical professional, maybe that means the next patient that goes in with the same identity doesn't have to do it. And so you're taking some of that weight of expectation of labor and time and energy off of their shoulders. Um, but yeah, definitely having information that is already provided. If you tell them to go Google this or go look up this, then they tend not to. But if you put paper right in front of them, then it may, you know, has a better chance of them actually reading it. Um, and personally, I just felt that it was a, a lot easier to talk from something that was already prepared than trying to corral my emotions in the moment and try to say what I wanted because that always ends up in you later going oh that's not how I wanted to word it or that's I missed something really important so for me uh, especially with my neurodivergence it's just really good to have everything in in writing in advance thanks so much um Tiffany mentioned in the chat too that she brings her iPad with her so she has the questions for her doctors as well as can write down anything the doctors respond with, which is a great tip. Anyone else on our panel have uh, any thoughts about how you counter stereotypes about your condition or things about you um, in order to sort of break through that? It's a hard one, so you don't have to answer. It's Roger. Um, I don't know about solutions, but just, I have a couple of examples. Um, there's, there's often an assumption that um, the community that you belong to um, is providing you supports that you need. So I was within a, I think, a, a one, one week I was traveling across Canada and there were three things that happened that were, um, you know, quite disturbing to me. Uh, first, I was in, in the north, in, in Yukon. And when I arrived, the uh, women in the Inuit community were expecting me. Um, I was there for a totally unrelated thing. And I, I, I didn't even, why do these people know who I am? But they said, the ability guy is coming, the ability guy is coming. <laughs> okay, great. Um, it turned out that these women were not getting supports, women with disabilities, because they were uh, expected to get these supports through the band council um through because they were indigenous people um so they fell through the cracks through all the supports from regular government because government said well we're giving those supports to the band council so therefore you you know you already provided for and the band council didn't treat disability in the way that we'd like them to treat it i'm being diplomatic here um and so these women were not getting supports to the to the point where um, they were not getting their uh, dietary concerns taken care of. Um, one lady just said to me, Roger, I'd like to have a shower. I, I haven't had a shower in five years. Um, so these type of things were, were going on with the community. Um, and so although I wasn't there for that reason, I did talk to some of the government people and they had just assumed that because these, these people were a part of the uh, Inu community, that they were being provided for. I fly from there to uh, Nova Scotia, where I was doing some work within the Black community in Nova Scotia. And I, I get a call asking me to go and speak at a, at a, at a church. And I'm, why do they want me to speak at a church? 
it turned out that it was a lady who had been in bed for seven years. And the reason she was in bed was simply because of some mobility concerns. Um, social workers had been visiting the family. Uh, they lived in a, a, a rural area and no one had provided any, anything for this lady, like a lift or a wheelchair or any of those sort of things. And again, I go to the government, why, how could you let this lady, you know, she's in bed for seven years. And they said, well, we just assumed because she was African Canadian, she lived in a black community that, you know, things were being taken care of and that they didn't really want her, want her help. Um, so these were two totally distinct communities, um, you know, on different sides of the country. I fly back to Vancouver and a friend of mine had invited me to go to one of the uh, sick temples for lunch. And so we go there and the first thing I encountered was uh, all the garbage cans were, were kept in front of the accessible door. They had a wonderful door with the button and the whole shebang. Um, but we had to clear the doorway at first. And uh, we go inside and the people were sort of just staring. And I didn't know if they were staring at me because of the wheelchair or, you know, because what's this black guy doing in the sick temple? I wasn't sure at first. Um, but eventually a group of men came over and approached me and they started to ask me a bunch of questions and they started to touch my wheelchair. And, you know, if it, was, if it was another person, they might've been uncomfortable, but I could tell it was just a natural curiosity. Well, it turns out, this is in Vancouver, not so many years ago, it turns out that there were people within the South Asian community who had particular disabilities and didn't know where to go for resources. There were language issues and cultural issues, um, you know, and so when they saw me, it was their first opportunity to actually, you know, talk to someone uh, personally to bring up their concerns. Luckily, I was able to connect them with some people in their community that were connected to, um, you know, to medical supplies and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, it amazed me because the Nova Scotia and the, the Yukon were relatively rural communities and, you, you know, unique communities. But Vancouver, this was the metropolitan urban community. But because of culture, um, they were not connected to the mainstream support systems that, that we have. Um, and so I think that kind of ties into the, it may not be so much stereotype, might not be the correct word, but it was simply the, the, the belief of the system that these communities were taking care of themselves and that everything was fine and that they didn't face the same type of problems or issues that the rest of the society has. So I just thought I would share that. Thanks, Roger. That's a really great uh, anecdote, too, because what I've got from that was that um, we can't assume that everybody knows that there's help out there, um, that they know about the services available, um, or in the case of the Nova Scotia government, that they know the needs that aren't being met um, for the individual. And, you know, that still happens to me to this day, even um, when I think, you know, I, I'm in an intractable, like frustrating conversation of advocating for myself or someone else. And then some, uh, I'll go, wait, I just, can I just check in with you? Did you know X, Y, Z about this person um, or about me? And it'd say, oh, no, 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 we, you mean you aren't covered under, like, for example, myself, that you're not on PWD. I'm like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not eligible. Um, and, and so sometimes it's important to sort of take a step back if you feel like you're up against sort of an attitudinal barrier to say, do you, are you aware, you know, this is my situation or like circle back at it and see if it's an understanding problem. Um, and that's, those are some really sobering sort of stark differences you saw too. Um, so I should add is that sure. not necessarily a solution. Mm -hmm. But I have worked with those communities since that time and have encouraged them to kind of step outside of their community sometime. Um, if they want to plug into these, you know, systems, we tend to, you know, want to congregate with those that look and sound and like ourselves. But sometimes we have to, you know, just 
maybe even be uncomfortable and 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 be a part of our larger society so yeah definitely scibc has been doing some work trying to get more of our uh, resources translated and and we have a, a south asian um peer support group as well um but it is like it's a bit of a bridge building from a variety of angles isn't it um thank you for that uh those great stories um uh, all of you. Um, so we're getting, this went so fast. Um, I still don't see any hands, so I'm going to just charge on through. Um, I'm uh, curious, sort of a lightning round. Um, if we can go to around to each person and if you could share, what's one issue that you have ahead of you for yourself or maybe for someone else? that you really care about, but you're not sure how to change or you're, you can't see the solution ahead of you. What do you think your next step is? And Heather Lamb, can you answer this one? That's a really good question. Uh, this isn't so much an individual issue because it affects all of us, but there's a lot of ableism in the medical or healthcare profession. They tend to have a focus on fixing or curing and for most people with disabilities, that simply isn't possible. And for the, those of us who will have lifelong situations, I think we come across um, a lack of knowledge within the medical system about how we can live well with what our current situation is. Obviously maximizing our health and wellness, but also recognizing that we will always have so-called disabilities. The medical system is not well-trained in those issues. and one of my many goals around advocacy is to help both medical professionals and government to understand what that actually means, what ableism is, and how we how we can or should be combating that. Um, improvements in legislation will help, but that's only the very, very first step. We've got a lot more work to do in terms of education and I think showing what is possible with the right supports and the right accommodations. It's a long road. I don't see it ending anytime soon, but I think we all have a role to play in our small ways of educating the people around us and hopefully um, educating up, up and coming professionals. So one of the things that I do is speak to university classes as often as they'll let me come about disability and try and encourage them when they're young and when they're in their educational phase to learn about disability and um, how to work well with people with disabilities so that they can carry that out into their careers and also hopefully educate the other professionals around them. Thanks, Heather. That's, that's a very good point. Um, we do have a hand and I've got another question on from the chat. So I'm going to go to Barry and then um, to Lucy and then I'm going to take the other questions. So Barry? Oh, I think Gordon's hand was up before mine. Okay. Um, all right. Let's take a pause. Gordon, you go first. Um, thank you. Um, I'm in a, in a situation where um, I live in residential care, but our manager is a nutritionist. Uh, she's not actually an RN. And uh, um, for that particular reason, she thinks that we're residential, whereas we're actually complex care. And we can't get Thailand Health to acknowledge the fact that we require a totally different care package than what um, what uh, residential care does. Um, any ideas? Tough one. Any thoughts on the panel about that one? That is a tough one. Um, my old staples, Gordon, are. Um, making sure I understand who's in the chain of command, like who that person reports to and how those decisions are made. And in Island Health, um, like many health authorities, at a certain point, it's a committee uh, at a certain, like a board or a regional board. And for some reason, I find that a little bit easier if I have to write a letter or ask to present or express my, my serious concerns. There's something about it being a group of people that might not all agree and they know that the other people are going to know what they think about it. 
see, yeah, I love it. Because I have written to the, uh, to the quality um, care people, mm -hmm. and uh, um, they didn't seem to have a solution for me either. They didn't, uh, didn't seem to have uh, the ability in which to, to uh, sort of weigh the person's mind. That's a really tough one. Um, mm -hmm. I, that you were absolutely right. The patient care quality mm -hmm. safety committees are the sort of first line of defense, but they seem to be better with specific areas where things went wrong rather than chronic problems in healthcare delivery that are just have always been wrong. And, right. um, and that, that might be an issue for your MLA or for a legal aid a lawyer okay. like class. Okay. But Heather has yeah. a suggestion, Heather Lamb. Yeah, definitely um, ombudsperson, MLA, and possibly the licensing body. But if you want to give me a call next week on InfoLine, and we could talk a bit further about the specifics of the situation, maybe try and strategize. I don't think there's a yeah. simple solution for you. I'm sure you already know that, uh, but we can maybe come up with something. Uh, I don't have ability to a phone, so. Or email, or if somebody's able to um, contact me on your behalf. Sure. Okay. Um, um, if, this is Roger. Um, In my experience, um, the more work that you can do on on understanding, articulating, documenting what it is that you want. Um, because oftentimes those, the bureaucrats, whoever's in charge, they, they really, they, they want the low hanging fruit. Um, so if you can present them with, you know, a, a package or whatever it is, uh, you're gonna probably get a lot further in trying to get what it is that you're trying to, 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 to accomplish. Um, so just, you know, do your research, um, you know, put this together in a, in a very succinct way. Um, and then sometimes they're not really even necessarily, and I hate that I'm saying this, um, but doing something that they think is, is wrong, they just, they don't, they, don't, they don't understand or they don't know. So the more that you can do to help with that, I think the better chance that you might have. Okay. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Um, and I think that um, we can also call you, Gordon, or we can organize to set things up on Zoom if that's easier for you with Heather uh, Lamb. Well, so. Zoom is definitely easier because this, this is my medium. Awesome. Uh, I think we have your uh, info too. So we'll follow up after and make sure we can okay. get you connected to Heather. Appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Barry, do you, I'm just going to circle back to uh, Barry. Did you have an answer to that last question or a new one? Or uh, No, I just wanted to make a quick comment that, um, uh, as everyone knows that our, knows that our medical system can, is broken and can be improved, but we can't, we can only, we can make change, but change can't happen if we don't raise these issues up. Um, if, and even though it's really scary, I think it's, it's important to uh, not be afraid of questioning things. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't, uh, don't be afraid to ask peers. There's great places like SEIBC, um, uh, S, uh, whether it's Disability Alliance or BC organizations, there's a couple of people here that are on nonprofits. But it takes time to develop your voice, but we we can only affect change if we raise these issues up, right? So it's up to us. And there's power in our lived experience. And I feel that feel like people like us with this living with disabilities, um, you know, our lived experience is power is powerful. Like there's power in that. And it's um and all we're looking for is quality of life, but unfortunately we have to fight to the nail to get that. So for us to make these changes, we have to bring them for forward. Definitely. Um, I know I've had some success with um, uh, approaching specialists or people I was afraid didn't quite understand the enormity of my situation, approaching them with a, a cover letter, kind of summarizing the information I gathered, plus 
the relevant evidence. And if you're not familiar with um, medical research or then that kind of thing, your local librarian can be a real ally there. And there are organizations, um, I would first suggest contacting um, your library by email or phone just to um, ask for what support they know of if you want to access journal databases just to do some research but there's also like some great there's a free uh, search tool online that offers free access to most journal databases and just you know uh, freely available evidence um, of a credible nature that you can gather too I think it's easy to forget that um, our healthcare providers and the decision makers are often faced with a multitude of just minutia, like lots of administrative tasks that are repetitious. They see the same kind of people. And so they are not used to seeing people like us or complications like ours. And so it's, uh, it's really good to, um, to try and give them a picture in a way that they are best able to take that information in. And you can ask them those questions too. You can say, hey, how can I best share some evidence with you about this condition I'm dealing with? Because I'd really like to hear what you think about it and like sharing it with them in a way that invites their opinion can sometimes diffuse some of that frustration uh, that they might have with like, well, who do you think you are? Um, we are going super fast here now. Um, oh, Jeff Gartrell suggests something really smart. Um, the Seniors Advocate uh, of BC is also a great support and the Ombudsperson, as Heather mentioned, um, also really useful. And there's a legal support clinic called CLAS, BC, C-L-A-S. Um, they usually are the people who determine whether your approach uh, whether your issue is something that could be referred to the human rights tribunal or not, but they also can um, review a case and give you some ideas of where to take it if they can't help. Um, so uh, I'm just checking in. I think that we have, we're just like closing up here. We're getting lots of great um, uh, comments in the chat. Nicole Soleil's on right after us with her uh, games night. So if you wanna um, go unwind from this heavy talk, um, they have a great time and her information's in the chat on how to get involved. Um, I'm, since we're closing up on 725, I wanted to leave it with um, Lucy and I'm curious to hear what your, um, what are you working on advocating for right now? And what's your next step? Yeah, so right now I am currently working with the, with the hospital close to me um, in order to get um, an accessible washroom there. Because even the, even a hospital where you're supposed to go to get help, uh, you can't even have like your basic human needs there for my sister that we go and, oh, we can't go into the washroom. The wheelchair doesn't fit. Oh, sorry, there's no lift. So it's been a problem since we've, I think it was three years ago when we first contacted them about the washrooms. And only now is when we've been able to start getting things going. So that's what we've kind of been working on at the moment, but I've also been you know, doing a few other programs and groups, you know, just speaking out. I feel that's a really important part of advocacy is not just action but speaking and just kind of letting the general people know because the more people know about it the more people talk about it then it's going to be easier along the road to get things done um, absolutely yeah so yeah hopefully the next step will be to get a good washroom installed in my local hospital and a few other hospitals around in my area that are being renovated so hopefully we can reach out to them and get them to renovate the washrooms properly so everyone can use them. Absolutely. That's a fantastic um, cause too. I've become more aware of the changing places movement in Canada from the UK, um, which is about 
installing changing tables for adults and lifts in bathrooms around around society um, because there are so many people who can't use regular bathrooms that are supposedly accessible at all. And I think to myself, if I didn't know I had a bathroom I could use in public, where would I go and where would I not go? So, um, well, like just like the question, um, how many doctor clinics are there that can we access? You know, not very many. <laughs> like, how can we get into a table on a on a bed at a doctor's clinic? Yeah, There's Heather no and I are working on a survey of dental clinics about accessibility, and um, it's a real it's a real concern and like. I somehow accidentally ended up with the only doctor in Nanaimo that has a power operated bed, like a lift and so that I can transfer onto it without endangering myself. Right. And, um, and I had a doctor who refused to do a physical exam on me because she didn't have an accessible bed. So if I had all the time in the world, I would have taken her to the human rights tribunal because it can't affect someone's care, right? right. Um, anyway, can of worms, speaking of, but um, oh, yeah. I know I really, pre that, that is the, the meat and potatoes to pick up our food theme of, of advocacy around healthcare is access. Uh, like, is it truly accessible to us if we can't be examined in the same way for that matter? So, um, I'm really excited to uh, have to open up our um, next session, which is tomorrow. And um, I just want to thank all of our panelists so much for being so candid with us, sharing your skills and um, insights and your experiences. And I invite the chat to uh, share your comments in the chat. And thanks to our panelists for being so uh, candid with us.